Have you told your friends that you see ghosts? Oh, absolutely not. Gina Rodriguez returns in Not Dead Yet. I'm back, baby. Who is up? Oh, she's the obituary writer. And Brad Garrett joins the brilliant ensemble cast. Titan, Maverick, Titan of all Mavericks. These are all words used to describe me. Baby, I got you shook, got you shook. Not Dead Yet, season premiere. Tonight, 8.30, 7.30 Central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Trouble in Little China was not quite the success that John Carpenter hoped it would be. He just got half of the goddamn cast together to do another movie instead. And that movie is Prince of Darkness. It's full of weird satanic imagery, terrible mustaches, and it's so bad that it scared Adam away, which is why this intro is a little lackluster. Join us as Scott and I discuss Prince of Darkness from 1987. Uh, now, Scott, you're the one that picked this one. You're so welcome. So enlighten me on it. All right, so this movie is not good, uh, especially for John Carpenter. Um, his the standard that you would expect from John Carpenter, who a lot of people think made arguably the best remake of all time, The Thing. Um, I I like this movie. It's I like it because it's absolute trash and makes no sense. Um, it, it's it's something that's been on my long list for us for years. This goes back to the Reddit Horror Club days for me wanting to pick it, but I thought that now was the time. Uh, this is like a November movie for me. That's why I picked it in November. Uh, for whatever reason, I think maybe the first time I ever saw it was some like dreary ass day in November in my, in high school or something like that or college. And uh, now it just kind of like feels really bleak when you watch it. Um, it, it it gives me like it's not a good movie like i said like the acting is garbage the storyline is completely nonsensical it's like john carpenter read the abstract of <laughs> uh like string theory paper and was like oh okay okay i got it <laughs> i'm gonna write a stupid fucking satanic panic horror movie that is so loosely based in science, but I'm going to throw in like five buzzwords that I just read. It's going to be a good movie. Um, and, and they have like a good budget for this movie and Alice Cooper shows up and they've got Mr. Miyagi in it. Um, but they, they, they just, it's a mess of a film, but that said, it feels like I, it gives me a sense of dread every time I watch it. I've watched it like six times, which is a lot for a movie that's not good, but Every time I watch it, it it feels like it's hopeless. You know, that's the whole kind of it. The, the feeling of the movie is supposed to be this impending doom. And I think that while the movie is not good, the tone is there. And I thought that that would be worth having a discussion about. Uh, Scott, I just want to just want to clarify for you, um, the Victor Juan is not Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. Okay, uh, cut that part out. <laughs> no, 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 we're keeping this. Victor Wong, because it's understandable why you got slightly confused. Victor Wong is actually the grandfather from in, Three in Ninjas. Gremlins. And Gremlins. He's in Gremlins, right? No. <laughs> is that Mr. Miyagi that's in Gremlins? I believe so. Um, God damn. He was the, he's the grandfather in the Three Ninjas movies. And he's also the shop owner in Tremors and okay. Big Trouble in Little China and The Golden Child. He was the other Asian old man that appeared in a bunch of movies of our childhood. <laughs> in the 80s. Well, okay, so here's the thing. It's been a long time since I've watched any of the movies that the actual Mr. Miyagi was in. And I honestly can't say that I've watched The Karate Kid more than once. 
and I didn't watch any of the sequels because karate movies just don't do it for me. Uh, so, uh, to my credit, the most recent film of all the ones that you just mentioned is Big Trouble in Little China, which I watched within the past calendar year. So, uh, um, please forgive me. <laughs> I, but then this is also coming from the guy who got Johnny Depp screwed up with somebody else. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> I have to say, while I agree that this is not a good movie... I feel like this movie actually still shines a really bright light on how good of a director John Carpenter is because the movie still looks great. Like there's some awesome camera scenes. There's, there's this one scene in particular where it's a very simple concept. It's one of the kind of grunts in the, on this project walking down like a staircase and down a hallway, but the way that the camera moves and keeps like zooming out and it just does this great job of building and growing the isolation and like making you feel dread. Like this guy is literally never coming back up from this adventure that he's going on down these stairs. Wait, what uh, part was that? Uh, it's uh, the dude who gets his head like turned around by um, Kelly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The blonde. Yeah. Who gets impregnated with, the devil or uh, okay yeah. we, we we need to chew the fat a little bit about this oh this movie is confusing concept. as fuck to talk about <laughs> like, well, like i okay. looked at my notes and i was like i'm not even trying i'm not even gonna try to explain this movie let me try then all right because no i've for, watched it enough times it's an hour and 40 minutes this was my first time watching it it's an hour and oh, 40 minutes okay. And I'm pretty sure that an hour of that movie is just trying to set up the plot line of the movie. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> what we have is theoretical physicists who, by the way, look like they're 40. You know, I mean, I don't quite understand the casting decisions in this movie. So did John Carpenter write and direct this? Uh, I believe so. I will okay. confirm it, in a second. All right. Well, while you're doing that, so yes, so he did. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't know if that really explains much, if it, if that helps explain anything or not. But so he he has these forty year olds, and it might just be the mustaches, but and the eighties clothes. But um, they're these theoretical physicists who are in college, or maybe it's grad school, and they're getting a doctorate, I suppose. But uh, they're getting it from not Mr. Miyagi, who has quite possibly the worst facial hair of anyone in existence. Uh, it's just like the weirdest scraggly. He has like one long white hair that grows on the corner of his mouth on one side. And it bugged the shit out of me. <laughs> but um, so so <clears throat> he is the main teacher. His name is Birak. Um so Birak is this super famous theoretical physicist who believes that in quantum state there is no good or evil. I, that's kind of what we're trying to get at. And he's obviously uh, an atheist. And, and the whole point of this movie is to try to it, – it's, it's another one of those stupid-ass satanic panic movies from the 80s where they were trying – to say this weird thing about how science doesn't have the answers um it i don't understand john carpenter's thought process as he's writing this because i i love and appreciate his work i do and i but also i am very much a science-minded person and and if you're gonna blend your science with your sci-fi or your horror um you can't just throw a couple fancy words into the script and it just wa hand waving and it makes sense. Like it's very, very confusing. I've watched this movie enough times that I can at least track the, the, the idea, but it doesn't, it, at the end of the day, it's all gibberish because I don't actually know what John Carpenter was trying to say about physics, science, religion, the origin of evil, in man things like that um because he's throwing a lot of high concepts there's like five high concepts in this movie that are never really com like the, the they just kind of exist and they're never concluded so uh <clears throat> donald pleasance shows up chewing the scenes 
as best as he can because that dude is just he was in so much shit film but is good at all of it like i watched whatever that movie is that like years ago i watched that mo- raw meat you ever see raw meat no okay it's basically like the midnight meat train but without the vampire demon monsters in the ground and it's just like cannibals it's kind of like the descent meets the midnight meat train so um but donald pleasance is like an investigator and that's probably the worst movie I've ever seen him in. But even in his worst moments, that dude just exudes charisma and talent and um, all the other things that RuPaul wants in a drag queen. So uh, Donald Pleasance comes in. He's this, he's this, uh, this priest who finds the manuscript from this guy who was the head of this thing called the Brotherhood of Sleep, which, by the way, I'm totally down with that brotherhood. I love the Brotherhood of Sleeping. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, that that's my number one note in this film from this film. Um, anyway, so the Brotherhood of Sleep. The whole point, I believe, was to keep this protoplasmic evil sleeping in the basement of this church, which is really a stupid fucking place to put it. Because if you're really going to try and keep an eternal evil being asleep and not using hobos to kill other people and keep this experiment going, you should probably put it out in the middle of the goddamn desert. Uh, But, you know, I think also the reason why I enjoy this film is that you ever read the SCP Wikipedias or like the, the, the fanfic out there? Like it's, it's like haunted objects and monsters and things like that. No, I I never have. Okay. I, I feel like you'd really enjoy it. I've, I've read a lot of the SCP stuff. And I, I kind of shy away from the joke ones because it goes from um, being very silly to being absurd to being straight horror to being kind of sci-fi to being existential dread to being religious. There's a lot. It's it's uh, anybody – it's a community-based – kind of. it's kind of like Dungeons & Dragons but with horror – and it's not on a tabletop. It's just stories. And some people write original stories and the people expand upon them, things like that. But uh, I could absolutely see this this green goo being one of the uh, SCP characters or an SCP item that is, like has the ability to influence minds and is this this eternal evil creature that uh, is, is always trying to get out into the world and and. It would be. I mean, read some SCP and and you'll you'll understand. But um, the whole the whole crux of the thing is that the Brotherhood of Sleep has kept what I believe to be an analog of the son of Satan asleep uh, in this goo f- for two thousand years. Jesus was a an ancient alien uh, who was. Oh, I'm sorry. Also. The devil was an ancient alien as well. So evil comes from the stars. Jesus was an astronaut. Comes to the comes to America. Comes to America. Jesus Christ. Comes to Earth. Uh, vanquishes this evil. Starts the Brotherhood of Sleep. People think he's a heretic. Kill his ass. And then the Brotherhood of Sleep lies about it. Creates the Catholic Church. Have all these priests that are teaching that evil is in the hearts of men and is not an actual being and brings us to the present day. But then everybody that comes close to the goo has a dream from the future of someone coming out of the church. And um, so, so we, we have many scenes of that, which actually the, 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 the tachy- it's <laughs> he learned about John Carpenter learned about tachyons and was like, I want to use that in a movie. I'm going to make it happen. So tachyon <laughs> beams move faster than the speed of light, apparently. So that's why they can go back in time. And so the these future people are sending tachyon beams back to to uh, 1999 or something like that. I don't know. Um, and And it's a warning to the people that are in the church. And they get it every time they fall asleep near the goo. So the goo has this incredible power, but all it does is piss in people's mouths. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) This movie is like a a water sports dream. 
I feel like it awoke something in a small segment of the population in 1987 when it was released and and it spawned an entire subgenre of porn. So, uh so it pisses in people's mouths and it turns them into zombies. Uh which you know I don't like zombie movies, but they go around and they kind of do the bidding of of the this protoplasm. And but they don't do it in any sort of like time effective manner. It's like, oh, I guess I'll get to killing you. Oh, I guess I'll break down this door. Oh, I guess I'll just stare at the mirror and cry <laughs> for 10 minutes at a time. Um, but it's a really good time. This movie, as you said, uh, oh, uh, uh, so, so before we kind of just talk about how fun it is or how good looking the movie is, um, at the end of the movie, uh, they, the, uh, Kelly, who has grown a, a, a belly full of, full of green goo and is trying to pull her kind of eldritch evil father through a full-length mirror that has no place in a in a church rectory um and then somebody smashes the thing oh oh i'm sorry the um uh the the redhead runs uh, uh, she couldn't just push kelly into the into the full length mirror. She has to grab her and fly through it as well. They smash the mirror. Mustache man number one cries himself to sleep, um, has a dream that she comes back and is all mangled and then falls back to sleep and then has the tachyon dream some more where you see that it's her coming out of the, the, the church like a decade later or something like that. So there are, there are no answers to be had. If you, sit through this almost two hour confusing ass movie. But I think that that works to its, its strength actually. And that's what makes it feel so doomy and dark and hopeless is that no matter what you do, the, and the whole brotherhood of sleep thing, they, they spent two centuries, or I'm sorry, not two centuries, uh, 2000 years, um, trying to keep this evil at bay and no matter what you do it's kind of just a ticking time bomb that's why i like this movie that's why it makes me feel it makes me feel something which is a lot more than most of the movies we discuss on this podcast can say you know like it it actually has like a visceral reaction regardless of the fact that it's not a good movie yeah no i i and i don't think it's a bad movie we've watched some way worse movies for this podcast like way worse movies <laughs> but <laughs> i mean the list the list for that is pretty extensive there's some like pretty cool moments though like i actually really like the weird dream sequences from 1999 um me too 1999 didn't look like that by the way yeah anybody listening uh it, it looked it did not look like 1987 but with film grain <laughs> well do you know how they did those though <laughs> was that they shot all of those on video and then put the videotape into a VCR and just film the TV set so that it had like a very weird, like distant quality. That's why like, the audio sounds kind of fucked up too, is because it's not the actual audio. It's the TV audio being recorded by the cameras. And I just think that that's but such I feel a like cool such a, like, lo-fi. A low... Yeah. That's what I was going to say is like, you know, when you're like, Oh, do you know how they did that? I thought you were going to say something crazy and trippy for 1987 but like if if i were to do that in 2017 i'd still be like yeah let's 30 years later i'm like yeah why don't we just put it on a vhs play it through a vcr and and tape the tape the tv like when they did beyond the gate you know that barbara crampton film last year yeah which uh, i still haven't seen but it's watch it with a group I think it's more fun that way. Um, I was I had low expectations going in, and I think that the concept is sweet. I think that they had a great build up, but then they lost steam later on, and they didn't have enough. I don't think they had enough money to really actualize what they were going for. But Barbara Crampton shows up. Like the whole point of that movie is that there there was a very short amount of time in the eighties where where um <clears throat> they had board games like D and D, but they were connected to a VHS tape that you would use and you'd like, you know, make decisions based on what the video would tell you to do. Yeah. Uh, And so Barbara Crampton, it's kind of like a haunted videotape and she like tells them what to do. But I feel like what they did was they 
CGI'd Barbara Crampton onto a TV screen instead of just doing what John Carpenter did in 1987 and just videotape her shit and play her through a VCR. I mean, it can't be that much more work to, to buy a working VCR on eBay, right? I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, all right, so I've got just a couple notes for this one because uh, I was actually kind of – I was watching it pretty late at night, which definitely affected my ability to like write stuff down. But I actually you were part of the Brotherhood of Sleep. Yeah, <laughs> but I was really like drawn in. Like I was like, I I kind of just want to see how this plays out. Like I wish that I'd seen it previously. Um, but I will say that there's a few pretty sweet things. Uh, I really like the death of the uh, the one scientist who looks like Eddie Dizon mixed with Stephen King. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, wait, which which death was his? Was his the, where the head gets popped off? He's like ripped up in the alley. Uh, it's the one where Alice oh, yeah, Cooper's was, staring at him. As a, yeah. <laughs> um, I love the bugs in a human body suit sequence where there's like the one guy standing outside and his voice sounds like a hundred different voices talking at once. And all of a yeah. sudden everything about him starts to fall apart and he's just a pile of bugs in a suit. Yeah, that. But see, that's that's where this movie does the right thing. You know, I've definitely talked shit about uh, Italian horror in the past, like Fulci and stuff. Um, you know, like the Gates of Hell, right? That's that's the one with all the the, the bugs and the guy who makes the the girl like puke her guts, right? I don't. I've never seen Gates of Hell. I'm a big fan of Phenomena with uh, Jennifer Connelly, where she's like telepathic with bugs. Yeah, yeah. Well, that movie's. No, I was going to say great, but I think that it's just good in like a this movie is ridiculous kind of way. I also have a really weird feeling when I watch it because Jennifer Connelly is one of my longest term celebrity crushes. She's basically like it's she's just too young in that movie for me to watch it and not try and like mentally slap my wrist like don't think about Jennifer Connelly the way you normally do, <laughs> you know, like romantically. So, yeah. but, but I, I, I love movies with bugs. You know that. Cause I did, I picked ticks and I seem to have an affinity for them in general. But, um, I, I love that scene because it does that thing that those Italian horror movies do is they have great scenes. Like this movie has great scenes in it, but it doesn't make a great film um it actually makes it feel way more disjointed which works on some level because it makes it feel like a nightmare it feels like things don't matter and in this reality things don't have to matter and since that's true then all bets are off and you can't really stop yourself from getting murdered and turned into a walking corpse that seems to still have some sort of existential understanding of its fate like um uh calder the black guy in this movie um he gets possessed by the goo and then he stabs himself in the neck and 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 still comes back a second time and then he's that's why he's like stare i believe that that was the implication of when uh the priest is watching him like cry looking at the full-length mirror it's because he's like i can't die you know like and, and the guy that turns into bugs he goes pray for death and then his head falls off and he turns to bugs yeah but it's like because they're all doing this bidding of this eternal evil and and they can't die. So it's almost like it doesn't matter if you die because you're still going to be stuck in this horrible, painful state where you're doing evil things, but you can't stop yourself. So I think that that also plays into why this movie feels dark. <clears throat> but if we're if we're looking at it from like a strictly storyline perspective, this movie's shit. Yeah. Um, and. I, I will say the last real note that I have, um, it's a real downer ending, which like, I guess was kind of like John Carpenter's go-to thing for the most part. But like this one particularly bummed me out, I guess, where you've got like the main, the, like the main character per se, cause there's a lot of main characters, but like one of the main characters love, pushing this eternal demon into a into this portal and getting sucked in there and just due to bad timing 
you know, Donald Pleasant just destroys the only way that she can come back out. It and, felt kind of like a. It, it felt silly though that that uh, she wouldn't, as I said, that she wouldn't just push the monster in. But it 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 that's the. It just felt like bad writing. Yeah, you know, like she could have pushed the thing in and it could have still come back out, but it wouldn't have had the emotional heft of the main guy and the main girl being separated because she sacrifices herself to save the world basically well not just that it's the it's the like nightmares that he has because like you kind of get the feeling based on how like caked and sweaty is and that that's not the first time that he's had that night nightmare and it's probably not yeah. going to be the last time he has that nightmare and like that's just such a bummer <laughs> it's... yeah yeah I, and and that's what this movie does well is it just is dark but it's not like ghoulish it's not our typical over the top gore i mean there's gore in it but i feel like that's not what it's about which is somewhat refreshing especially after the last month of well the last two months of like super over the top stuff that we've been talking about but i mean it's not a movie that i it's not a go-to movie for me it's not a movie that i think is (laughs) deep I think it's incredibly shallow. I think it's the most shallow John Carpenter movie ever. Um, I mean, he right? did make Memoirs of an Invisible Man with Chevy Chase. <laughs> well, I think that I, – okay, so it's shallow in that it's it's trying to be deep. It's like, you know, in 10 Things I Hate About You when the 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 girls are talking about like – um, you know, I love my Prada backpack. Yeah, but but I know I love my shoe. I love my Skechers shoes, but I don't love my Prada backpack. It's like that, where it's it's so incredibly shallow, but it's trying to talk about deep things that I don't know, man. It's it's a real paradox of a film. Um, I wouldn't suggest people. I'm I'm actually blown away by the fact that you never watched it before, but it makes sense. Because it's not a movie that people talk about a lot. I feel well, like when this drops, people are going to be like, oh, that movie. So I feel like an idiot, but uh, for the longest time, I thought it was a vampire movie. And I'm just not a it's vampire. Because of the cover. Yeah, I'm not a vampire yeah. guy. So I was just like, meh. Like, there's a ton of John Carpenter movies that I've just kind of been like, eh, towards and like never wanted to watch because I'm not like super into the subject matter based on what I think it's about. But I- I'm glad <laughs> that I finally watched this one. It's. It's good. It's not great. It's good. I'll probably rewatch it again in a couple of years, but I don't really see it being like a, a man. I got to put that like I, mean, I can't stop thinking about it. Let me put it on again. No, no, not at all. No, um, I'm actually really disappointed because that Adam couldn't be here on the episode because um, I feel like he would have had so many questions because he's the kind of person that likes it when um, if it's going to be laid out, it's laid out. And he gets upset when it gets laid out halfway and then they just go on to the next stupid subject. So And that's I'm, like I'm this entire movie. It's like yes. they start they start giving you some information and then it just cuts to someone dying and then like some other person's sub story and then after like ten minutes they're like, Oh, let's 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 explain some more about what's supposed to be happening in this. Yeah, the the editing is really wacky. Uh the camera work is great, you know. I mean in, in the uh, it just is very uneven, and as you, I think it has a lot to do with the editing because it. They tried to break up the exposition because this movie is like fifty percent exposition because there are so many concepts that they're trying to get at. But also, can we talk for a second about? And maybe this is inappropriate for me to say because I got Birak and Mr. Miyagi confused. But I feel like there's a really weird Asian stereotype going on in this film um, because there are three Asian characters in this movie and they're all actually Asian. Um, It's not like we're whitewashing these characters or anything like that, but we've got Birak and then we have two scientists, which are Asian. One is the guy who Walter Walter and Lisa uh, and Lisa's the one who uh, transcribes the, the, the book, right? Yeah. Yeah, so so there is this really weird scene that has, just sticks out to me every time I watch this film, where Walter sees Lisa and he like does this weird Asian gatekeeping thing where he's like, 
Oh, I guess you are Asian or something. Or maybe you're not Asian. Oh, he said, you know, you could pass for Asian. Yeah. And then she's like, fuck you. Or like, whatever. She just gets pissed off and walks away. He's like, I thought it was a funny joke. But I wonder if there was some lead up to that that got left on the cutting room floor because it makes no sense in context. And it's all I mean, she's like she looks Asian. I guess that's the joke is that she looks Asian. And then he says that she doesn't look very Asian. But then. What's the point? Well, I, I feel like he constantly tells like absurdist, a uh, like mock Asian jokes, like the uh, the rich doctor joke that he tells. Oh, oh, oh! I have that note written down. Um, he wants to be a millionaire when he's forty, right? Well, it's the one where he's he's like nervous, so he's just telling random jokes to the possessed. Oh, oh, that part. Yeah. No, no. Earlier on, he goes, I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 40. And I was like, you mean next year? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, he looks so no he has like, he's like the, like an Asian girl comes home from her adventures and her parents see her get off uh, the plane with her new husband. Who's got a giant bone through his nose. And she says, no, I said, I wanted you to a marry rich a rich doctor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That character really rubs me the wrong way because especially because he's so charming and is basically the hero of Big Trouble in Little China. And now in this one, he's like the wise cracking douchebag. Yeah. Well, I just feel like this movie does what a lot of ensemble cast movies do, where it just has a problem fleshing out everybody. Um, they they'll give like either really straight overview and exposition of a character and then that character gets no development or they'll have really specific things like this character where he has this personality that's completely fleshed out but there's no explanation why he's talking this way um the other the other thing and i feel like we i mean we've been talking for almost 30 minutes so this is probably a good thing to end on but the thing about this movie that a lot of people don't talk about um unless they're they're film buffs is that this was John Carpenter's return to independent cinema. Um, he had gotten really frustrated with how much studio interference came into Big Trouble in Little China and decided that he was done with working with studios and was going to be an independent filmmaker again. Um, and that's why a lot of the cast is like just people he's worked with in the past. You know, like he's... Um, and this was just kind of his like you know, getting back into doing things on a on a micro budget that he raised himself. And he did this and they live and then was kind of roped in to do memoirs of an invisible man for a studio. And I don't know if that led to him staying with studios or if he continued to mostly do all of his horror stuff independently. But he really hasn't made much. Uh, he did Ghost of Mars in 2001. And then uh. he did <laughs> then he did The Ward uh, in 2010. And that's the last thing he's made. Well, he doesn't have to work anymore. Yeah, he no. Just goes to cons and people pay eighty fucking dollars to get a picture with yeah. him. Yeah. Well, I was like, I was gonna say also, if you look at his IMDb credits, he's got so many credits throughout the last twenty years, just based on the Halloween franchise of him getting a writing credit for them utilizing a character that he created. So I'm sure that he gets at least a little bit of cash for that every single time. Well, okay, I, I absolutely. Agree, and that's probably where his revenue come or his his you know like he can live off of that. But it just seems to me like okay, John Carpenter was so hungry in the seventies and eighties. I mean, late seventies, early to mid eighties, and he would like he did soundtrack, he wrote, he directed, he basically like you know he has all these properties that he created as well as he built like the template for so much of what we saw in 80s and now uh kind of like retro style horror and he helped create synthwave because i mean without the the halloween soundtrack i doubt that I mean, the popularity of that movie, it was it was a runaway success. I feel like that had to have been a cog in the machine that created the sound of 80s horror and then 
it bled into sci-fi and then we got blade runner that has a very similar style soundtrack and that aesthetic gave us turbo kid which is and stranger things and you know like all that stuff i just feel like he he did so much and was so creative that doesn't just dry up overnight man like and not even over the course of two decades i don't feel like john carpenter is the kind of person that could be just sitting around being like, well, my royalty checks are coming in. I don't have to do anything. I can go to about 10 or 15 cons a year and make bank and, you know, live in L.A. if I want to or whatever the hell I want. I mean, doesn't he want to to create? Like, as a creative person myself, I don't make money on what I do creatively. I have a desk job that pays my bills so that I can be creative. So if you have something paying for you to live – your creative spark should be completely free, you know, to do whatever the hell you want. It just seems so strange that he hasn't done anything for, for uh, of actual substance for 20 years. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that that, I, I think we both can connect with that because like, meanwhile, you know, you know, the schedule that I put in to just doing horror movie night. And then on top of that, I'm, you know, doing this boy meets world podcast on the side I'm trying to produce another show uh, for 2018, and we're talking about launching a Geekscape Wrestling podcast in 2018 that I'm going to be the host Holy of. Shit. So it's like, I for me, it's just like, no, I just want to produce content constantly. It's <laughs> it's, it's an obsession. Yeah, it's a, I'm sorry. It's it's like I'm trying to think of the right word for it because it's not like an obsession because it's not like I you couldn't take a break. And then come back to it. But it's a compulsion. It's a, and you get uh, – when it's going well, you get addicted to how well it's going. It it was a, it took a really long time for me to walk away from doing the St. Mort show. But once Horror Movie Night really took off and started to do well, it just seemed pointless to do the St. Mort show anymore because it was getting listened to by about 20 people and it was more stress <laughs> than excitement. Um, yeah. But like with the Boy Meets World thing, it's fun because I'm only doing 20 episodes a year and I can just record them throughout a series of months while I'm like hitting conventions and doing other stuff for Horror Movie Night and then compile those episodes and release them. Um, and then, you know, the the produce the, the show that I'm looking to produce, I'm probably not even going to be on the mic for, you know, 95 percent of the episodes. I just saw a really cool opportunity to produce another podcast. And like, I don't know. I think that, I think that when you're a creative person, you're drawn to that stuff, but we've been talking for almost 40 minutes on this movie. It's not even <laughs> been a particularly funny episode, but you know what? People really liked our it episode. So maybe they, they liked the break of the ha for like a more sincere in-depth look on uh, one of the lesser films of one of the greats. Are you looking to travel beyond the void? This is Alex from Beyond the Void Horror Podcast. Join me and my co-host Brittany Bloodshed every week for two episodes on Monday and Thursday. Do you like to drink, laugh, and talk horror? Well, so do we. We make up funny skits, horror shots each week, news, and rotating segments on Monday like great plots where we make up movies on the spot, interviews, reviews, and a lot more. Plus, on Thursdays, we break down two horror movies with jokes and loads of trivia. Go to longlivethevoid.com to check out Beyond the Void Horror Podcast now. So, anyway, what did you watch this week? <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so this is a little bit late, but I wanted to talk about other stuff while we finished this season. Um, we watched Riverdale. How'd you like it? And oh my god. It's... Oh god. I could spend an entire episode just talking about how garbage that TV show is. Like, it is the most CW TV show of all time. It takes a great concept and just shits in its mouth. Um, so... The first se- the first episode is great, and I feel like the the the, the creative team uh, of episode one is completely different from episodes two through thirteen, because in episode one, Betty, and, well everybody is dressed like it's this weird retro modern thing where it because Archie needs to be fifties inspired. Like, it needs to have that aesthetic, and they did it. 
Like Betty's wearing super cute outfits. Archie's kind of I mean Archie's relatively wholesome. Everybody's wholesome, but um there's suppo- the whole thing is it's a murder mystery and it's um so the the town has dark secrets and that's why it's called Riverdale blah blah. blah. Um it's a beautiful TV show. Uh the cinematographer or cinematography group is great. Uh, but the script writers are awful. I actually believe that they might be 14 year old girls sitting around in, in like homeroom writing the script for this because it makes no sense. Like one day Cheryl will be friends with Veronica the next day or the next episode. She'll be a mean girl. And some days it's like, and people are so handsy on this show. Like, Grown-ups are grabbing kids by the elbow constantly and threatening them. How are they not getting trumped up on assault charges? And uh, Archie fucks a teacher, and when people find out, she just leaves town. But she's a sexual predator. She is – she's a pedo- – she's a, an aphibophile. She's a pedophile. She's a child molester because she did it previously in other towns and had to leave. And then she came to Riverdale. She fucks Archie for a couple weeks. And then when she gets found out, she leaves. But as she's leaving, she like licks her lips as she's watching two hunky teenage boys walking down the street. What in the actual fuck do these people think happens in real life? Because it sure as fuck doesn't happen on this show. The every, every character is absolutely unlikable except for Betty and Jughead. Actually, Jughead's really fun. Um, Betty, is the only pure character in the show where she doesn't do something shitty for a stupid reason that makes no sense for her actual character. I am so upset, and Megan hates it too. Like, we hate this show with a fiery passion. I don't think that we've ever watched a show that we hate so much but needed to finish to find out why it was 13 episodes long. It is the worst show I have ever seen. I recommend anybody to, like, not watch it Avoid people who do watch it. I'd rather watch 13 hours of wrestling back to back, like bad wrestling, not even like the top. Like, I don't even know what good wrestling is, but I mean, you know, like stuff that you would be like, OK, a non wrestler wrestler would like. I'd rather watch the shitty wrestling in front of 10 people where none of the guys are doing anything right. And it's super fake looking and they're hurting each other because they're so bad at it. I'd rather watch backyard wrestling with a bunch of idiot juggalos. Even I can't do backyard wrestling. Yes. (laughs) That's how bad Riverdale is. Like Riverdale is, it's, it's an abomination to television and it sucks because it has a great concept. Um, all right. So I'm going to go in a completely different direction. (laughs) Yeah. Nothing to say about that. I'm going to go in a very uh, different direction on this. Uh, so I don't actually have a movie that I watched recently, but I have a book that I just finished reading, and it actually ties into one of our previous episodes from the first year. Um, I read Horns by Joe Hill, and that book has made me hate that movie even more because of how much better that book is <laughs> like that book is so good and i'm going to explain to scott why i like this book so much because i d- did not enjoy the movie um but i'm going to give a warning for people who want to read the book while i'm not spoiling anything that wasn't already spoiled in the actual horns episode if you're interested in reading the book and don't want it spoiled for you go ahead and uh, skip it whatever okay so here's the thing that i really really like about the horns book And I don't know why they didn't do this with the movie, except for some stupid desire to have a big reveal. So as you remember, in the movie Horns, uh, Harry Potter wakes up with horns on his head. Everyone thinks that he murdered his girlfriend a year ago. uh, But when he goes to people, they like confess things to him. And... um, he realizes that he might be able to solve the, the mystery of who murdered his, his girlfriend. Uh, and then it ends up being his best friend and it's revealed in like some absurd fashion where he's talking to his best friend for help. And the best friend just confesses to it and then kills Harry Potter. And then Harry Potter comes back from the dead to get vengeance or whatever. The way it's done in the book, which is like 365 pages is He has the horns. It's driving him nuts. He goes to his house to try to, like, 
talk to his parents to see if he can figure out what the hell's going on because that's the only place that he feels safe right now. And he bumps into his brother, and his brother, seeing the horns, feels the desire to confess to him to not trust his best friend because he was there that night and saw the best friend murder the girlfriend. And that's in the first, like, 50 pages of the book. And then from that, the rest of the book is him trying to figure out what his friend's motives were for doing that and why his friend would do that. And then it's all this backstory on the friend and how the friend like has always been a psychopath and just kind of learned that if he copied everything that Harry Potter's character would do as a guy who is ultimately just this good hearted person, no one would ever suspect him because he was the friend of like the nicest guy in town type situation. Um, and it's just a really well, like it's well written. It's well crafted. A lot of the absurd out of left fucking field shit in the movie doesn't feel nearly as absurd in like the written context of the book. Um, I just really enjoyed it. I breezed through it in like three days. Like I just couldn't put it down. And it also helps when like the chapters are like, you know, anywhere from like five to 10 pages. So like you finish a chapter and you're like, yeah, I'll do another one real quick. And like, (laughs) (laughs) like that's always my issue is when I'm reading a book where like the chapters are like 40 pages. I'm like, I don't have the time. Like, I (laughs) Here's, here's a thought, and it's a question, just a side question for you. Do you think, I mean, and it's been a long time since I've read a book and kind of like noticed chapters. I mean, it's not that it's been a long time since I've read a book, but it's just been such a long time since I've read a book and really felt the chapters. Do you think the chapters as a as like a, a, a tool of writing have become less popular? Uh, I think they're not as like i'm trying to think i think that there's a lot of books where like i've noticed it too where the chapters are literally like the next chapter just starts in the middle of the fucking page where the previous chapter ended and in those books it's real easy to like lose track of oh yeah this was like a i I just finished a chapter and i'm starting a new one versus like ones where like you know there's a big old blank space and then the next page is where the next portion of the story starts like that usually feels more to me like okay yeah this is a chapter um and what i mean more so is just like for me when i hit the end of a chapter i'm like okay this is my stopping point like because i do a lot of my reading right before i go to bed Mm -hmm. so like if i hit a stopping point what usually happens is i'll hit a stopping point and i'll look at the clock and be like all right let me see how many pages this next chapter is to decide if i want to move forward or not And regardless, like if I look at a chapter that's 60 pages, I'm thinking I don't have an hour to read this, but I'll read 10 chapters that are six pages long (laughs) and not even think about it. Like, cause I'm just like, Oh, I can do another six pages real quick. And then like, so I think it's just a, it's a weird thing of it being divided up in that way. It justifies my desire to keep pushing forward versus when I'm like, I, I feel like I need to be in like a perfect, like no one's here to bother me for the next 60 minutes as I try to get through this chapter. Cause I hate stopping mid chapter. Like that's the thing I don't like doing. Yeah. I mean, I guess I get that. I mean, for me, I think that chapters only register when they have those weird interludes between, you know, yeah. I mean like for me, I'll read before bed. And the stopping point is when I can no longer keep my eyes open. Um, just, just, I, I'm not good at pacing myself really at all. <laughs> um, part of my personality, I guess. But, um, you know, I, I'm just trying to think of something I recently finished. I mean, I guess, I, I, you know, like Rogue One. I, I slogged through Rogue One, which is kind of a boring book, but. Um, uh, th- between each one there were these little between each chapter there were little like <laughs> star wars emails more yeah. or less you know like they were they were com- their the communications between um o- other characters in the the story and uh that actually made it feel like there was a uh, an actual switch between stories or uh, between between um perspectives cuz some chapters would be the same characters. Some chapters would be different characters, etc. But uh, I just—they don't register otherwise for me because I'm just—I'm like 
in it and I'm just reading paragraph after paragraph until I can't read anymore and I'm just like falling asleep and I have to read a paragraph three times in a row and it's still not sticking in my brain. I don't know. I mean, I really like reading, but I it's been a long time since I've even thought about chapters and that's why you mentioning it now is just such a – it's just making my brain twist in a weird yeah. way. Well, short version of it is um, I think it's a really good book. I think that it definitely shows that the, the King – uh, family writing talent uh, is genetic. Um, this is the second book by Joe that I've read. Third, if you count reading the uh, Lock and Key comic book series. And I actually think that he's, it's still early to say, but I think that he has a more talented craft than his father in a weird way. Because because he can be succinct yeah i was gonna say it, his books are are for the most part quick and easy they're never like they're like three or four hundred pages but they also don't i love stephen king books when they're good but there's a lot of bad ones and there's a lot of good ones that also get bogged down by going way off onto like tangents that don't really lead anywhere whereas all of these books it feels like every single chapter and every single word matters and I think I remember talking to my roommate about it because he was a huge fan of Joe Hill. And he said that whereas Stephen King is kind of he writes the book and then that's the book type thing. Joe Hill uh, rewrites the book three to four times, constantly thinking, is this important to the story? Like he he gets to the end and then he rereads it and says, you know what? A lot of this I don't need and then writes it again. And he constantly writes it until he has only the information that's necessary to tell the story in it. And I, I, I appreciate that method. <laughs> I'm not, I do too. No, I think that that's super important because more is not better. Yeah. I think that it's, it's kind of like with music, like you could write a 12 minute song and it, it could be super unimpressive. I mean, it can be impressive because it's 12 minutes long, but that shouldn't be the, identifier of a good book or a good song it should be about pacing yeah so that was prince of darkness from 1987 as picked by scott uh next week we're going to be talking about a movie that i picked and scott is super thrilled about it <laughs> um <laughs> uh don't forget that you can always purchase merchandise on our website now we forgot to talk about that that's been a thing for a while Go to hmnpodcast.com, and there's links to pretty much all of our stuff. Check out our Patreon account. Check out our uh, store. Check out old episodes. Visit our Facebook page. Visit our Twitter account. All of that stuff. There's plenty to do. Uh, um, this episode was not nearly uh, what you're used to for Horror Movie Night, so I'm going to end with um, dick joke, dick joke, fart, titties, fart, shit, dick joke. <laughs> listening to the Geekscape Network.